Good afternoon, everybody. That just cost me four seconds right there. I wonder if you saw this uh, in the press that shark attacks around the world are at an all-time low. Marine biologists didn't know why. They couldn't explain it. But marketers knew. It was the recession. <laughs> Seaside vacations were at an all-time low. See, the study of human nature is the business of marketers. Our job, our skill, is to understand the concept of desire. Now, I am an ad man. My job is to get my clients' products in the path of that desire. Now, the ultimate goal, the holy grail, the pot of gold in my business, is to create the easiest, smoothest, most velvety, most speed bump free path to that sale. That pursuit is an obsession with almost 100% of the companies that sell any products or services in this country in the world. It takes a remarkable skill to achieve that. That's not what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about a lesser known aspect of human nature, a quirk in our collective psyche that not a lot of people study. I want to talk to you about the fact that sometimes people want, sometimes people need friction in the process before they'll buy a product or an idea. Not the elimination of friction, which advertising and marketing try so hard to achieve. I'm talking about, I'm advocating the implementation of friction in the process a perfectly counterintuitive concept that can be the magic ingredient in persuasion. So let me give you an example. In the late 1950s, a major food company introduced instant cake mixes. But instead of a spike in sales, sales flattened. Housewives were ignoring the product. So the food company went back to the drawing board to try and figure out what the problem was. When they did their research and talked to housewives, they discovered something very interesting about human nature. They discovered certain emotions that surround the act of baking. The just add water element of instant cake mixes was making women feel bad. There wasn't enough work involved. 1950s housewives who had a pride in homemaking weren't invested enough in the process. In order to feel the rewards of baking, they needed to be persuaded that they actually had something to do with the baking. So, armed with that information, the manufacturer went backwards in the recipe process and decided to remove the egg. Then they re-released the instant cake mix with instructions asking women to put the egg back in themselves. Sales spiked. By increasing the friction of having to add the egg to the cake mix, by adding an extra step that they had first removed, women were attracted back to the product. Sales spiked and never looked back. Years ago, when Johnson & Johnson were looking to create an antiseptic cream for cuts and bruises, the scientists not only came up with an incredible product, but they also put a cherry on the top. Their new antiseptic cream was painless. It was to be a category killer. So Johnson & Johnson released the cream and sat back to reap the fruit of their science. The cream sold like crazy. First time trial looked like this. Second time retrial looked like this. Nobody was buying it a second time. Johnson & Johnson could not understand it. So they went back to the drawing board and started doing research in focus groups and talking to customers. And they, too, stumbled upon a very interesting aspect of human nature. If we don't feel pain, 
we don't think we're being healed. Fact of life. So Johnson & Johnson put a little alcohol into their product to give it a sting. You know what happened to sales. The added friction of pain gave the product credibility. Johnson & Johnson revenue started piling up, while Johnson & Johnson scientists sat back and shook their heads in disbelief. If marketing has taught us anything over the past 100 years, it's that friction can be a powerful tool in persuasion. While the world beats a path to the door of smooth, speed-bump-free interactions, only the very smart and very insightful marketers use friction to make a sale. Back in the 1970s, Clairol introduced a new hair conditioner, or rinse, as it was called back then. Up until that point, the hair conditioning process had only been available in hair salons. So, Clairol gave women instructions on how to use their new hair conditioner. The instructions had three steps. Work conditioner into hair, let sit for 30 minutes, rinse. But here's what you need to know. The conditioner worked in less than two minutes. But Clairol knew something about human behavior. They knew the process women were used to at the hair salons took 30 minutes. So that was the exact amount of time Clairol suggested that women use their product. Why? Credibility. It gave Clairol's new product, Hair Salon, credibility. Without that, the product probably would have failed in the critical launch period. So Clairol added the incredible inconvenience of sitting around at home for a full 30 minutes with conditioner in women's hair. That's a lot of friction, considering the product worked in two minutes. But friction aligned the new product with an existing belief system and made it legitimate. So let's switch gears to present day. In the field of fundraising, friction is increasing donations and opening wallets. Now, charities have long studied human nature to try and understand what triggers it can use to persuade people to give more generously. And I'm fascinated by one particular method they use. Now, many of us in this room have had, a don have had donation forums sent to us in the mail. It's a common occurrence. Many of those donation forums look like this. So look in the bottom left-hand corner. You'll see a $500 box, a $50 box, and a $5 box. Here's the thing. The charity has no expectations of getting the $500 box checked off. None whatsoever. That box is there as friction. When you see the $500 box, you're meant to go, gah, $500, gah! <laughs> now at the same time, the $5 box is a smaller form of friction. It's hardly worth the stamp to mail a check for $5. They know it, and you know it. The $50 box is the target donation. That's the one they want. So they frame the desired response with the shock of the $500 box and the embarrassment of the $5 box. And friction guides you to the sweet spot. It's kind of the Goldilocks strategy. A little too hard, a little too soft, just right. In the world of online shopping, Friction is an interesting tool. An analytics person at Google told me a great story a couple of weeks ago. He was asked to replace a five-step cart checkout process on an e-commerce site. Five steps to checkout was just plainly unnecessary. So he replaced it with a rich internet application. It replaced the five steps with just one step. 
As he described it to me, that one step was, quote, gorgeous. It had advanced error checking. It could even do minimal functions like changing quantity or add, adding recommended products. It could be retrieved even if your internet connection went down and so on. It was loaded with features. It failed miserably. People preferred the five-step process. Why? Because it made them feel more secure. The friction of five steps gave them a sense of added security. Amazon has one step, one click buying, as you know. But I would be most interested to know what percentage of their buyers use one step or prefer the multiple step alternate route. I think I know the answer to that. Shopping is a process. In a study recently I read that in supermarkets have discovered something very fascinating about human nature. The narrower the store aisle, the more crowded a store is, the more people buy a variety of goods. The narrower the aisles, the harder it is for two shopping carts to navigate around each other, the more friction that happens in that aisle, the more shopping goes on. Because in Western cultures, where we live, choice is a way to exert control over your environment. So if you're confined, if you're forced to be cramped in a store, you'll want to try to control the experience by exercising choice. It's the one thing you can control. People will buy a wider range of goods as a result. Wide open spaces, not so much shopping. Squeeze it down, cramp your customers, force them to feel confined, and they will lash out by buying a greater variety of goods. <laughs> Did you know this? 50% of all products returned for refunds are in perfect working order. New owners just couldn't figure out how to use them. Marketers know people have a fiddle tolerance. People will only fiddle with something for 20 minutes before completely giving up. Knowing that, Steve Jobs sees product packaging as a forced way to guide customers through new, unfamiliar technology. So take the mouse. It was packaged in its own compartment to force people to unpack it, pick it up, look at it, and plug it in. Jobs could have made that packaging way easier, way quicker, but instead, he enforced the friction of having to unpack the mouse onto his customers. He did it to make the mouse less alien when they had to use it for the first time. He infused the unpacking routine with friction so it would be performed in a certain sequence to force people to get used to the mouse. The return percentages for Apple products are at industry lows. Next month, the IRS in the States will begin doing what they do every year at this time. They will begin planting stories in the press about people who have been convicted of tax evasion. <laughs> Not good news stories, bad news stories. The friction from those stories, the fear those stories induce, sends preemptive sparks out across the US and scares people into filing their taxes. One last place I want to take you. There is a book out called The Checklist Manifesto, written by Dr. Atul Gawande. He's a surgeon in Boston. There are something like 200,000 deaths in the US per year due to medical mistakes, preventable mistakes. So Gawande looked to other high-risk professions to see how they prevented errors, and he talked to pilots. Their method of preventing mistakes was simple. They had checklists. Pilots have to go through extensive checklists before they can take a plane in the air. So Gawande created checklists 
for surgeons. Once hospitals started using his checklist, preventable mistakes plunged by 80%. A remarkable change. Unfortunately, his checklist has only been adapted by one-fifth of the hospitals in the U.S. 20% of surgeons outright refused to use the checklist because it's too much friction. The checklist slows them down. They see themselves as highly trained professionals. It offends them. They don't want it. But then go on to ask those holdout surgeons this question. If you yourself were going to be operated on by another surgeon, would you want that surgeon to have completed the checklist? <laughs> the checklist or the friction that Gawande is trying to introduce into hospitals will save hundreds of thousands of lives. Friction works. As I hope I showed you here this morning, friction brings with it many positive things. It brings credibility, as we saw with instant cake mixes, Johnson & Johnson's antiseptic cream, Clairol and online shopping. And friction can guide and steer people toward positive outcomes, as we saw with fundraising forms, Apple hardware, the IRS, supermarkets, and the checklist manifesto. When I sit down to try and figure out how to market something, and when I need to understand the human nature element at play, it, I will many times look backwards to books written by Madison Avenue in the 40s and 50s, which are among my favorite. And sometimes I'll look back even further, sometimes centuries. Because the more things change, the faster change happens, the more change that changes, the more I look to the unchanging man. Bill Bernback was probably the smartest ad man who ever lived, and he preached that philosophy. Study the aspects and desires of man that never change. These are our most fundamental traits as a species. Everyone is familiar with the yin and yang symbol? You see one here and behind me? It stands, of course, for the seemingly opposing forces in life that are interconnected and interdependent in our world. The black side stands for yin, or soft. The white side stands for yang, or hard. It symbolizes the duality of life. One side cannot exist without the other. Night moves into day, winter exists with summer, loudness with silence, hate cannot exist without love, etc. But I wonder if you've ever looked very closely at the yin and yang symbol. Have you ever noticed a little white dot in the black side and a little black dot in the white side? See, inside every yang, there's a little yin. Inside every yin, there's a little yang. In other words, friction. Inside that symbol that has been with us a thousand years is the insight. Friction is the secret ingredient to life. So if you need to try to make people believe, if you're ever struggling to get people to a certain place, if you're ever looking for a leverage point to move a mountain, maybe what you need is a little friction. Mary Poppins once said that, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. And I'd like to revise that if I may be so bold and say a little spoonful of sand might make it go down quicker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>